Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach for Maine Woodland Owners. We're an, a membership organization based in Augusta, nonprofit. We provide resources and expertise to woodland family, small woodland owners. Harvey Boltman hey. said, Merry Christmas. I don't know if he's listening to this or what, but it just came up. Yeah. Hello. I'm going to go ahead and mute folks. So we have a we have some uh, ability to um, have, we're going to have Dan Jacobs presenting soon. So I'll go ahead and make sure everybody's muted. So if you are, a lot of you are already Woodland Owner, Maine Woodland Owner members. We'd love to have new members uh, if you have not joined yet. If you, as a member, you receive a monthly newsletter um, and updates and information about programs like this one. And we also have a very informative, uh, uh, robust resource website at mainwillandowners.org. So hopefully you'll learn more about us after this program if you already don't. And we have a wonderful group of people, a lot of people with woods um, in all different parts of Maine. Today's program is is quite unique. Um, it is uh, the one of the authors of a publication that comes out of the Maine Forest Service Department, uh, The Woods in Your Backyard, Dan Jacobs is a, uh, a licensed forester. He's worked with Maine Forest Service for many years. He's currently um, the <laughs> Maine Forest Service Enforcement Coordinator. And sadly, he and or happily, depending on how you see it, he's moving on to Maine, the, the Maine uh, Environmental uh, Program, um, at DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, um, as a water quality um, special specialist. So Dan has been one of our resource people for articles in our newsletter around water quality practices in your woods. And he's also been a big part of this woods in your backyard program and a guide. And today he's gonna to talk about, um, he's, he's gonna talk about this particular guide, why it's important and um, how you can get yourself one of these guides and use it for, as you are working with your woods. For us as Maine Woodland owners, we are really glad to have this type of publication available to our members. We have um, uh, a lot of folks who are joining us who are relatively new owners. Um, this is a guide that's really going, that does provide guidance around first steps when you're in your woods, um, things to consider, but it's also a great guide for people who've owned woods for a while. It's a great reminder of ways that you can enjoy your woods, uh, protect your woods, considerations for uh, future um, management um, concepts. So uh, Dan, we're really lucky to have Dan here and I'm gonna have him um, join us here. He's going to do a, uh, about a 30 minute presentation and then we're going to open it up for Q&A at the end. So um, if you do have any questions as he's presenting some for some clear, if you need some clarifications, please uh, go ahead and unmute and just jump in and ask your question or go ahead and send the, your question on chat. Um, I will be monitoring the chat. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass this on to um, to Dan Jacobs. And Dan, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Thank you for having me, Jen. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, again, my name is Dan Jacobs and I work for the Maine Forest Service. Uh, I've been with the Forest Service for uh, a little over 23 years. Most of that time I was a district forester and I'll explain a little bit about that job uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, currently, and for the past two years, I've been the uh, Regional Enforcement Coordinator in Northern Maine. Uh, today, what I'd like to talk about is the Woods in Your Backyard, which is one of the Maine Forest Service five signature publications. And I'll um, have a slide on all those in just a moment. Um, this is a fantastic book. Uh, the first edition was uh, put out in 1999. And this second edition came out in uh, 2020, uh, right at the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, and I was a part of the team that uh, developed uh, and, and uh, wrote the second edition book. 
So this presentation will be at pretty much an overview of the publication, uh, a little bit of a discussion on the, the job at the district forester and how they uh, work with small woodland owners. Uh, we have a short video that is going to come into play about two thirds of the way through this. And then I'm hoping we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. And I appreciate everybody participating today. Trying to advance my slides and they're not advancing. Okay. Jen, can you confirm that that, that you can see that yep. new slide? Yep. Okay. So the topics that I'm going to talk about today, um, each one I'll talk about just briefly will be one or two slides in length. I'll give a brief background of the Woods in Your Backyard publication, uh, talk a bit about um, who the intended audience is and who can benefit from this book. Uh, really sh uh, briefly, I'll cover the team that uh, wrote the second edition publication. We'll go through the parts of the book and how to use the book. Uh, obviously, probably a lot of folks are going to want to get a book, so I'll tell you how to do that towards the end of the program. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, how that getting a book aligns pretty nicely with uh, the district forester program at the Maine Forest Service. And then, as I said, we'll have time for questions at the end. So hopefully uh, everybody can see this. This is a slide that shows the uh, five signature publications of Maine Forest Service. Um, and we have a lot of publications that uh, are on our website. We have uh, probably 30 plus information sheets on a variety of topics from tree growth to uh, managing Eastern white pine. Uh, so these are not our only publications. But these are the ones that we kind of consider our our premium publications, and they're the ones that are in the highest demand, typically. Uh, so for this talk, the woods in your backyard is uh, center stage, and I won't say much about it uh, during this slide, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail going forward. Uh, so starting from the bottom left and then going clockwise, uh, in the bottom left, we have the Forest Trees of Maine, which is, I am guessing, our, probably our most popular publication and our most recognized publication. And part of the reason for that is um, it was first published in 1908, and they printed 3,000 copies for, uh, for school children. And it's been in continuous print pretty much ever since that time. Uh, in 2008, we decided to do a centennial full color edition. Up to that time, it was just uh, black and white um, kind of line drawings of trees and parts of trees. Uh, so this is a tree ID book, all the native trees in Maine, a uh, few shrubs, and it's uh, extremely helpful to small woodland owners, and it's extremely popular. Uh, the next book, uh, moving clockwise, going into the upper left, is What Will My Woods Look Like? This is a newer publication for the Forest Service. I'd say it's between five and ten years old. And this publication, <clears throat> excuse me, can be very helpful for woodland owners uh, because it shows different forestry treatments and practices. Uh, it shows before and after pictures from the same locations. And it gives descriptions of the different uh, forestry treatments and practices and why they were implemented. Uh, so if you are wondering what a commercial thinning looks like uh, in a, a softwood stand, that one of those would probably be in this book and you could uh, see what that looks like and get a good description of it. So if you're considering a certain forestry treatment, then uh, this would be the book to... Yes? Is there a question? Nope. Okay. I just thought I heard somebody. Um, so this would be a book to look to to try and find an example of what a particular forestry treatment would look like. Um, excellent book, pretty popular, and um, 
one of our newer publications. The uh, next publication going in order clockwise is The Forestry Rules of Maine. Uh, this book is uh, relatively new. The first edition came out in 2014, and I was on the uh, development team for this publication as well. And this uh, gives a summary of all the different forestry regulations that are in Maine. Uh, and um, it's regulation by regulation summary with links to get additional information. Uh, it takes out all the, the legal speak and um, all the, the terminology that may be difficult for some folks to understand. Um, it kind of boils the rules down and makes it a, hopefully a little bit easier for people to comply. And as we all know, or, or will know, if you're new to forestry, uh, there are a lot of regulations to be aware of. So this, this book can be very helpful. Uh, the last publication I'll talk about is um, Best Management Practices for Forestry, Protecting Maine's Water Quality. And this is what we generally, generally call our BMP manual. And uh, this is um, a guide that can help landowners, loggers, and foresters uh, protect water quality on uh, timber harvest operations. And um, there's a lot of rules and regulations pertaining to protecting water quality in forestry. And this can uh, put you way above the regulatory safety net uh, if you follow the things that are um, described in this book. So very, very popular with loggers and foresters, but also of use to uh, woodland owners of all sizes. So I'll move forward. Um, this slide shows a comparison of the covers between the original Woods in Your Backyard and the new uh, revised edition that came out in 2020. Uh, originally, uh, the, the original book came out in 1999 and it was geared, it had a very narrow audience that it was geared towards um, the very small woodland owner. And you can kind of get that from the title, The Woods in Your Backyard. Uh, this was for folks that were very new to the outdoors in Maine, uh, hadn't done really any forestry work in the past, uh, were unfamiliar with going out into the woods, and they just had a, a few acres behind the house. Um, so the, the focus was quite narrow, and it was a very, very basic introductory guide. Um, but it had a lot of it had a lot of really good elements that could be applied to other audiences. So in I would say 2017 or so, we were thinking about updating this book because we had uh, given out all the copies that we had in stock in print. And it was time to either print some more or do an update and print some more. And of course, being published in 1999, uh, the book was a bit out of date. Uh, a lot of the web links that were in there had changed. Uh, and there is a lot more on the internet now than there was back in 1999. Um, and a lot more sources of information through the internet. So we made the decision to do a complete revision of the book. And it was kind of a soup to nuts revision. Uh, much of the book was completely rewritten. Uh, we had a completely new uh, team with uh, a diversity of disciplines involved. And um, we decided to reach out to not just the very, very small landowner, uh, but to other folks as well with this publication. Uh, so it's uh, completely it's more than it's more than a revision or update. It's it's almost like a new publication, but I think the spirit and the backbone of the book uh, remains the same as the 1999 edition. Um, one thing before I get into the text in this slide is that a lot of the pictures that are in the woods in your backyard are pictures that come from the Forest Service. Uh, particularly the district foresters when they're out in the woods or uh, they're helping folks, they uh, are encouraged to take pictures. And we have a pretty nice library of images at the Forest Service. And so most of the images in the book come from our foresters. 
Uh, however, there's a few wildlife pictures and other pictures that we um, brought in from outside, uh, like the bear picture on the left. Uh, that came from a wildlife photographer. I think that person does some photography for IFNW from time to time. Uh, the picture on the right is a vernal pool workshop that we did in Aroostook County years ago. And uh, you can see there that the um, instructor is gathering egg masses or looking for egg masses in that vernal pool, uh, amphibian egg masses. So that's one of our um, pictures from in-house. The uh, who is the audience? Well, the audience could be just about anybody in the world of, of forestry or the world of uh, the outdoors. Um, certainly small, small woodland owners uh, are an audience for this book and could benefit from it. But I think woodland owners of almost any size can benefit from this publication. Uh, home and camp owners that either have a few trees or they're surrounded by forest. Um, they can benefit from this book. Uh, students and teachers, there's a lot of activities that are uh, in this book. And I think that teachers and students would, uh, would be um, uh, advised to, to try to use some of those activities to uh, put some things into practice in, in school. And basically anybody with an interest in the outdoors, I think would have an interest in some component of this book uh, to some extent. So I, I feel that even a forester uh, who has training and expertise in forestry could probably get something out of this book. Um, so generally speaking, there's something for everybody in the, the new Woods in Your Backyard publication. Well, I can't see the top of my screen, so I'm trying to guess what that slide says. I did uh, go through the slides today, but it says, why read the uh, woods in your backyard? Okay, that was gonna be my guess. Thanks, Jen. Uh, why read the book, uh, Woods in Your Backyard? Um, well, it gives a great general understanding of the main woods. Uh, some things that are in there are project ideas and educational activities. I believe there's eight activities, which are kind of not really elaborate, but it, they take a little bit of work to go through them and they're fun. Uh, the project ideas, there's project ideas scattered throughout the book, and we'll talk about that in just a second. That's why I put project ideas in red. I think that will be our next slide will be an example of that. Um, there's also a really nice glossary in the back of the book that can help you with some of the forestry and natural science terminology. So there's not a lot of technical terminology in the book, but there may be a word that you bump into that you're not sure what it means. Uh, the glossary can be pretty helpful. So like, what what is an even age stand? That, that may be one of the terms in the glossary. Um, tips on how to get additional assistance. So throughout the book, there are, are web links. Um, maybe there's um, uh, some uh, guidance within the book on creating a rain garden. Well, in that particular instance, there's probably going to be a link to go and get uh, much more information on how to develop a rain garden and, and what a rain garden is. Um, there's also a really good uh, list of different organizations and agencies that can help a woodland owner out, and that's in chapter one of the book. So Maine Woodland Owners, obviously, is in that list of organizations. And there's a number of other organizations in there as well. Uh, Maine Christmas Tree Growers, uh, Maine Maple Association. Uh, so there's, there's a pretty good phone directory embedded in the book. In general, this book will help the small woodland owner improve and enjoy uh, their woodland. So there, there's a lot of different suggestions on things that can be done to improve your woodland, help you enjoy it, and get more out of it. This is one of the uh, project ideas. Uh, this is wildlife blinds. And um, this is something that is described in the book. And it, in the book, there's suggestions for locations for wildlife viewing blinds, uh, some ideas on different types of blinds that you could create. 
But then uh, there's links to an article at Maine Audubon that gives much more instruction on how to build an appropriate wildlife blind in a good location so that you can see wildlife. Uh, this image here was taken from um, one of our district foresters took this on Maine Audubon property. I believe that's in Falmouth. Um, so that's an actual wildlife blind that they have constructed. And your wildlife blinds don't have to be that elaborate uh, and they don't have to take that much time to construct. Uh, this is just one example. So um, you'll get a, a variety of different ideas if you use the Woods in Your Backyard book and the links that are included in the book. So that's an example of a project that's in the book. Another project, like I mentioned before, is uh, rain gardens. So there's a, a benefit to creating rain gardens in certain situations, and the book explains uh, how and why and um, how to how to create a rain garden of your own. Uh, just real quickly, I'll run through, through who the team was that helped develop the woods in your backyard. That was mostly Forest Service personnel. Uh, the rangers helped, the district foresters helped, our program people like our uh, community forester helped. So we had a lot of folks from the Forest Service providing input and uh, writing different sections of this book. And um, we did basically everything internally at very low cost. The only thing that we paid for was the actual printing of the book. Uh, we did all the design and, and everything and editing. Uh, so I think the taxpayer got a pretty good value on this one. Um, and it's, again, a very popular book. So from the outside, uh, we had Ted Shina, who was an uh, operations forester for Huber Resources at the time. He's now retired. Uh, but Ted has always been heavily involved in all sorts of forestry education opportunities. And he's worked with the Forest Service before on our publications. So Ted, Ted wrote some of the material uh, in the book, and he also reviewed the entire book and provided suggestions. Nancy Olmsted, uh, unfortunately, she doesn't work for Maine Natural Areas Program any longer, but she was their invasive plant biologist. So obviously she added information to the book about invasive plants. Um, and she was she was an excellent resource. Uh, she used to do a lot of educational work throughout the state. Uh, it's unfortunate that she, unfortunate for Maine Natural Areas program that she moved on, but she did. Uh, Harris Sohel is an epidemiologist with Maine CDC. And uh, because we have information in the book, in the Woodland Hazards chapter, related to uh, ticks and uh, other types of uh, insect borne pathogens or diseases. Uh, we had uh, Harris uh, provide information on those topics and uh, anything that we wrote on those topics she reviewed. So a pretty, pretty good team. There was also a professor from UMass Amherst that provided a little bit of information but I can't pronounce his name, so I didn't even put his name on the slide. But he was he was helpful as well. These are the six chapters that are in the woods in your backyard. Uh, the first chapter, knowing your woods. Uh, that chapter is the introductory chapter. It may be the longest chapter. Uh, it includes that phone directory for organizations. And it also gets you started on identifying dirt, uh, different features of your woods and getting you a little bit more comfortable and confident in getting into your woods. If you, if you haven't been in the woods uh, on your property yet, uh, this will give you a little bit of a nudge to, to feel more confident in, in getting in there and learning about your woods. Uh, optimizing non-timber resources. We're going to go into a little bit of detail uh, on this chapter uh, in probably the next few slides. So I'm not going to talk too much about that here. Uh, woodland hazards, that would be like how to, how to um, uh, 
approach your woodland during hunting season and stay safe? Uh, what about hazard trees that are on your property? So, um, and I think that in woodland hazards, I think that's where we get into navigation and orienteering. So how do you find your way around your woods, uh, not get lost? And, and what happens if you did get disoriented? Uh, that's in the woodland hazard section or chapter. Uh, chapter four, protecting your woods. Obviously things like uh, uh, protecting your woods from wildland fire, wildfire, that's in this book. And that's something that the Rangers did a great job in, uh, in writing for this uh, publication. So uh, wildland fire is in the book. Uh, I believe invasive plants fall in this chapter. Um, protecting water quality when you're working on your property is in this chapter. Uh, so a lot of good information in chapter four. Uh, growing and harvesting timber. Uh, there's a number of different components to this chapter. Uh, like I had said, Ted Shiner wrote some of this chapter, not all of it, but some. Um, uh, just for a, a heads up on what you'll find in there, there is a section on pruning to increase future value of timber. Uh, there's a, a section in there on creating uh, access roads uh, so that you can conduct a timber harvest and haul forest products uh, out of your woodland, off your woodland. Uh, so the growing and harvesting timber is uh, kind of a soup to nuts, ABC one, two, three type chapter. Uh, from great ideas to action. So the big thing uh, with this book is we wanted to cap it off with a chapter that sort of rolled everything together. And that is uh, in this chapter, we're talking about taking all the pieces that you learned about in the previous chapters, putting them all together into a plan so that you can meet your goals and objectives as a landowner. Um, that's when a landowner is reading the book. Uh, so this chapter talks a lot about planning, about working with a licensed forester and how to contact and, and find a forester. Um, it's, it's really a pretty good, um, pretty good part of the book that rolls it all together. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's um, information in this chapter on tree growth tax law uh, and kind of linking the, the planning requirements uh, to that, uh, for that, with just planning in general on a woodland. So those are the six chapters in a nutshell. Um, there are some sort of special features of the book. I call them special features anyways. Um, they're kind of neat things that we added in there. Number one, we've already talked about that. Uh, that's the phone book that's at the beginning in chapter one. And obviously, Maine Woodland Owners is one of the organizations that's identified in there as being a, a helpful and a use, very useful resource. Um, number two, there's, um, I believe, six do you know questions, one at the end of each chapter, maybe at the beginning of each chapter, but one per chapter. And these, these are questions about Maine geography and main natural history and the answers to these questions are in the back of the book uh, and the answers go into a little bit of description about uh, whatever whatever the topic or feature is um, so the example the year of the last log drive down the Kennebec River um, you guys are going to have to download the book or get a copy of the book to to find the answer if you don't already know the answer uh, the last special feature I'll talk about is the glossary. Uh, the glossary is pretty nice because it's a little bit different than some of the forestry glossaries out there that are very, very technical. Uh, this glossary, we tried to take the, the terms that foresters and loggers throw around a lot that a lot of people might not be familiar with. So something as um, simple as a snag. Um, foresters and loggers and experienced landowners throw that term around all the time. Uh, someone very new to forestry may have no idea what that means. Uh, so this glossary at several pages long, uh, be helpful with some of those common terms that we use uh, in, in the forestry arena. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so we'll take a little bit of a closer look at chapter two of the book, and this is optimizing non-timber resources. And I guess um, I didn't put it in here, but uh, I think UMaine Extension still has somebody that um, deals specifically in non-timber products. And I can't remember that person's name, but um, I'm sure that there is an extension specialist that is uh, specific to this area. Uh, so the sections in this book that are covered, uh, improving your woods for wildlife, uh, beauty and adventure out your back door, that would be things like recreational activities and improving aesthetics on your woodland, uh, producing specialty products, and that's what I'll focus on is uh, producing specialty products section. And then there's backyard family activities. And in this section, there's two backyard family activities. Uh, from memory, the first one is making maple taffy. And the second one, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm sure it's a fantastic activity. Um, so. We'll go a little further with producing specialty products. Hey, and I'll just jump in real fast. I just looked up at the main extension. There is a, a gentleman who specializes in maple syrup production and assistance for, for that type of product. So I just put that in the chat, the information about that program. Awesome. Yeah. You main extension has had some really good people as far as non-timber resources. And I don't know offhand, but I imagine that we've linked to the extension uh, publications for, for those different topics. So specialty products. Um, the three specialty products that we highlight in the publication are Christmas trees. And this is a Christmas tree grower, this picture here, Christmas tree grower in Holton. Um, he has fantastic Christmas trees and he's been uh, producing Christmas trees on his property for a long time. Uh, he also has natural stands on his property that he manages, but he's um, he's also a Maine Woodland owner member, uh, very active on his property. And uh, like I said, awesome Christmas trees. They're like perfect Christmas trees. Uh, this young gentleman in the middle who's uh, checking the sap bucket is... Uh, the son of the person, that, the forester that manages the University of Maine's uh, woodland. Um, so they do some um, maple syrup production on the University of Maine forest, and uh, this is part of their uh, part of their effort. And then the wreath brush collection. Uh, this person here is tipping. This is one of the pictures that is not from the Forest Service library of pictures. So I don't know who this person is, but she's gathering tips uh, for the um, for the um, production of wreaths. So those are our three products that we'll you'll find in the book. And getting a little deeper into maple syrup, these are some of the I wouldn't say key takeaways from the maple syrup section, but there are a few nice little excerpts. Um, for the early settlers, maple sugar was the most available sweetener. I don't know where I got that, but I get a lot of my information out of the main maple producer manual, which is kind of the Bible for maple producers. And um, it's I always find it kind of funny because that manual comes out of, I think, Ohio State, which I'd never think of as a big maple production uh, state, but uh, they have they have the the premier publication for maple. Um, so most people probably know that the raw ingredient for pure maple syrup is sap. Uh, sap runs in the spring when the nighttime temperature is below freezing and daytime temperature is above freezing. And now I live in uh, Arusta County and I usually participate in Maple Sunday every year, which is sort of an open house for a lot of the maple syrup producers and the, the general public is welcome to attend uh, their local producers' events. And um, in Northern Maine, Maple Sunday is, is always statewide, I think the third or fourth Sunday in March. In Northern Maine, the sap is running 50% of the time. So 
out of 20 years, 10 years, it'll it'll run by Maple Sunday. In 10 years, it won't be running yet in Arusta County. In Southern Maine, I'd imagine by Maple Sunday, the sap is almost always running by that time of year. So um, there's a lot of uh, regionality and differences across the state in terms of uh, when the sap will start to run. Um, and then, of course, like I said, and is right here, uh, we have additional resources for uh, getting maple syrup production information. Uh, we have an information sheet on the Maine Forest Service website on our publications page, uh, but you can also go to UMaine Extension and the link uh, it, to their publications is provided in the book. And I believe all the links are um, operable if you go to the PDF version of the book. You can just click on the links and you should be able to go right to these websites. So now I'm going to show you a uh, video or Jen is going to show a video and this is one of the backyard family activities. Uh, as I mentioned, there's eight uh, backyard family activities in the book. Uh, we initially thought that we would produce a video for each activity or for as many activities as possible. Uh, as it turned out, we've only produced this one video so far. Uh, um, so I, it would be great uh, following through with the maple uh, theme that we've just been on to show the making maple taffy, uh, to show a video of that. And uh, we don't have that. So what I'm gonna show you is, or what Jen is gonna show you is the three-legged compass walk. And this is, it's a little bit more advanced than the real basic information uh, in, I think, chapter three on navigating and orienteering. So if you make it through chapter three and get down the basics of the compass and orienteering and navigating, uh, then try this activity. And it's not that difficult, but um, it, it takes a little bit of doing. And it's a really great practice and, and learning experience if you're new to using a compass. So I'll let Jen chime in and show the video when she's ready. Okay. And uh, why don't you unshare your screen there? Oh, yeah. And yeah, this is also a terrific um, skill for people who are wanting to get into the woods more, but are maybe a little concerned about um, not knowing how to navigate and, and, and honestly know how to get out, which happens to me at times. So uh, orienteering through your compass is going to is always very handy. Um, so I'll go ahead and start this video. Just give me, I got to share my screen. Hello, I'm a Maine Forest Service District Forester. And I would like to introduce the second edition of the popular publication, The Woods in Your Backyard. The original version was printed in 1999 and was Not very seeing it, Jen. For small landowners, not seeing it, educators, and the general public. I'm not. Are you not able to see the video? No, I can hear it, but not see it. Oh, sorry about that. Let's try this again. How about now? Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Hello. I'm a Maine Forest Service District Forester, and I would like to introduce the second edition of the popular publication, The Woods in Your Backyard. The original version was printed in 1999 and was very well received by small landowners, educators, and the general public. The current version is set for release this fall the fall of 2020, and it has been fully updated. The new edition contains a great deal of information about forestry, wildlife, and outdoor recreation. It's in an easy to use format, and it contains a variety of projects and activities that are fun to complete alone or with your family. In short, the woods in your backyard is a great introduction to your piece of the main woods. Today, we will demonstrate how to complete one of the activities that's contained within the book. Hello, my name is Nolan, and today we'll be going through 
the woods in your backyard activity number five, the three-legged compass walk, which can be found on page 66. This activity, you will learn to travel through an area using a triangle-shaped route, and the route will take you back to your starting point. Now also, on page 64, you'll find a very detailed diagram of your compass. And now we're going to start looking at the parts of your compass. Now let's go over the parts of the compass. Right here, we have the base plate. Right here is a movable bezel. Right here is your direction of travel arrow. Right here is a mirror and your sighting notch, but you don't really need those. There are compasses that don't have them. We have one, but you do not need one. And right here is your magnetic needle. Right there is your orienteering arrow. And when you put those together, that means you're putting red in the shed. And that's going to be very important for when we do our activity. Okay, we're going to start off with our first step, and we're going to set down our marker so we can find our way back to it. And now on our compass, if we come in close, we're going to turn our bezel so the 40 degree mark is lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to turn our bodies so that the red arrow, so that the magnetic needle is within the red arrow, putting red in the shed. Now we're going to walk 10 steps. And that's our first step right there. And now that we're at our second step, we're going to turn our bezel again 120 degrees so that it goes on to 160 degrees lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to move our bodies again so that the magnetic needle is placed within the travel arrow. And that way, right is in the shed. Now we're going to walk 10 steps. That's our second step. And now that we're at our final step, we're going to turn our bezel again 120 degrees. So our direction of travel arrow is lined up with 280 degrees. And now we're going to place red in the shed again. And we're going to walk another 10 steps while keeping red in the shed. And that's our third step. The intent of this activity was to follow your compass closely, and if you're able to follow your compass closely very well, then you will have ended up back at your starting point, just like I ended up back at my tennis ball. Now, if that was too easy, you can make it more challenging by taking as many steps as you want, anywhere from 50 to even 100. Or, you can turn the page and look at the four-legged compass walk, which is an additional activity in your book. Now, thank you for watching this demonstration, and have a great day. Thanks, Jen. That was a, again, that's a very useful skill. And um, actually, I, I think we'll try to, I think we're going to try to do something like this in person at some point this year. Um, I'd love to uh, do a little bit of uh, navigating in the woods with our compass. So maybe you can join us, Dan. Oh, my email should stay the same. So let me know. Okay, good. Okay. Um, we only have a couple more slides and then we'll get to a uh, question and answer. Try to move ahead here. Okay, um, so now one of the important things that you'll wanna know is how to get a copy of the book. Um, one way, a really good way is to meet with a Maine Forest Service District Forester, uh, get some advice about your woodland and get a free copy of the book. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the district forester in just uh, a second. I won't go into too much detail, just a couple of bullet points. Uh, you can also contact the Augusta office at the number below or the email below uh, or the email listed, and uh, you can have a book sent to you. And I believe that they charge shipping. So typically, uh, the best way is to contact a district forester, and if you meet with them, they'll give you a book for free. Uh, what I usually do is if people want multiple copies, send them to the um, to the Augusta office. 
and because our policy is generally that a district forester can give out one copy per family or uh, per individual that they work with. Uh, you can also uh, print or view the book on our uh, website. And there's a whole page that's dedicated to the woods in your backyard. You can see that awesome video with that really handsome narrator again, if you want. So uh, our district forester program, uh, this program has been around for a very long time. Um, the map is uh, up to date that's shown in this slide. There is a map of the district foresters on the back of the Woods Near Backyard publication, but that map is outdated. Uh, we do have some turnover in these jobs um, and the, the uh, district lines do change from time to time. So go to the website, mainforestservice.gov and you can uh, find your district forester there. Uh, I think there's even a search by town to find your district forester. Uh, so there's 11 district foresters uh, in the state. And I was for 21 years, the one in red, uh, Southern Aroostook County. That's now Lauren Willette. So what does the district forester do? Uh, one of the things that they do that's super important and also one of the most uh, fun parts of the job is they can meet with landowners and provide direct technical assistance. They do uh, what we call a walk and talk, which is walk, walk your woodland with you, uh, give you a general description of the resources that you have, give you some general guidance. Uh, they could possibly work with you a little bit on tree ID, tell you a little bit about different programs that are available and get you started in the right direction. And when you do uh, arrange one of those walk and talks with a district forester, uh, they're able to give you a copy of the Woods in Your Backyard publication. So uh, it, it's really a, a good deal if you're a small woodland owner. Um, the district foresters also do a ton of educational uh, programs. They train and, and do educational activities with, with teachers, students, loggers, woodland owners. Um, everybody with an interest in the main woods, they uh, try to do educational programs with and for. Um, the district foresters deliver the Forest Service cost share programs, and we have a couple of really uh, beneficial cost share programs right now. Um, and they also implement parts of the main Forest Service enforcement program. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of rules and regulations surrounding uh, forestry, in particular timber harvesting, and uh, the Maine Forest Service has uh, regulatory authority for a lot of that. Uh, so these folks do uh, enforcement as well. And they also do resource monitoring, uh, which means that they collect data around the state as it relates to forestry and forest resources. And a lot of that data ends up in um, in reports that go to sometimes the federal government, like the EPA, uh, because the state of Maine has to do certain things to comply with federal regulations. I think I'm almost done, Jen. Okay, yep. Uh, so this is a snapshot of the Woods in Your Backyard uh, website. Uh, you can get to this through mainforestservice.gov and find all the resources and download a copy right there. And now, if you guys have any questions, we can try to run through those real quick. Thanks, Dan, for all that information. And I, I can't ex uh, say enough how important it is to uh, reach out to your district forester if you've never done that and you'd like to have them come and walk your property with you. They are, that is what they're there for, and they love that. So our website also has links to the district to the district forester webpage and you can just type your 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 town and you can find which district forester is yours and reach out to them. So jump in either with a chat or unmute and ask your question. I have a question. Go ahead, Betty. Betty. Yep. yep. Um, 
the grant programs that you offer, what what sort of uh, activities would um, would a small woodland owner qualify for with those grants? So our our programs are generally cost sharing and done on a reimbursement basis. And the the one program for small woodland owners right now um, would be the uh, Woodland Resource Action Plan. I think it's called which. We always call it the RAP plan, W-R-A-P. And that's a plan, uh, a, a basic plan for a woodland property for a landowner. And it would meet the requirements of some other programs like tree growth. And it would, um, I think, would pretty much meet the requirements of a, a plan for tree farm. Um, but it gives you a really good understanding of your resources and how to meet your goals. And obviously, it has stand type map and soils information, property line information, um, and not not a complete inventory of forest resources, but a good description of what you have for timber and non timber. So that that's the primary one for small woodland owners. And then we have a very active and growing uh, community forestry grant pro program, and I believe that that program is also uh, on a cost share basis, meaning a reimbursement for a portion of the cost. And that would be for towns. And um, I think probably like school um, uh, schools that have woodlots and things like that, but not necessarily for the small woodland owner. Uh, so the, the plan program, the RAP plan would be the primary right now. And that's and always a, that's a great place to start um, for any woodland owner is to have an opportunity to think about what they want for their land. And if there is some cost share funds to, to help pay for one that's that you work with a forester on, um, that that's even better. And the, the district foresters are really well tuned into other programs that are out there aside from Maine Forest Service. So uh, the USDA and RCS, they have uh, generally money to do forestry projects and practices and the district foresters are pretty well tuned in to what they have to offer as well so uh, they can they can give you good direction on that stuff so would that be over and above what uh, a private forester who's you know managing my woodlot would have is this more information that the one i use might not have access to um no, I, I think what it would do is maybe um, these things generally help pay for the cost of the work that a private forester would be doing for you. So if you wanted a private forester to prepare uh, a basic management plan for your property, that you and that forester could work your way through that wrap program that we offer, and that would help pay for some of the cost of that forester services is how that would work. So I think it would probably um, help with what your the forester you have is already doing, help you pay for some of that. And a, and a district forester often is the first forester you talk to. They don't do management plans, but they certainly will give you some ideas about, help you to start thinking about what you want. So when you do engage a forester, a consulting forester, you're ahead of the game a little bit and, and, uh, and they can help you take that to the next level and get your plan together. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Great information. Um, Kim Wendt just said to Dan that uh, she'd like to say thank you to Dan for years of great service up here in Aroostook. Much appreciated. And it's true. Dan, you've been a wonderful part of the Forest Service and we're really sad to see you leave the, the program. But again, I'm hoping we stay in touch with other other ways in other ways. Um, Bruce Davis uh, asked about um, any information about carbon capture plans or carbon credits. Is that something that this this book might, um, there's nothing specific in this book about it, but um, um, Bruce was just wondering if there's a, anything that might link to it. So in this, in this publication, no, but um, it's interesting that you ask that because we just filled a, a position that is specific to uh, carbon. And I, I don't know if this is the official title, but we were all calling it the carbon forester position. So if you go to the Maine Forest Service website 
uh, Andy Whitman is the um, person in that position. He just got hired on a few weeks ago, and he will be doing everything uh, kind of climate change carbon. Um, so that would be a resource for you to check on. Do you think the Forest Service is going to continue cost share for invasive species plans and treatment? That's from Jeff McCabe. Boy, I that's that's out of my wheelhouse. So I don't do very much with cost share programs, and my new role is a, doing regulations. And, and um, the person that I think is kind of heading that up would be uh, Jan Ames Santer. She's our community uh, forestry program person. Um, so if you can find her on the website through our Project Canopy webpage, she might be the one to contact to ask about that. Great. Yeah, um, right. I, I We get announcements from them when they are offering um, uh, funding for that, for invasive species plans and treatments. So the fingers crossed that it continues. The other one that, oh, I'm sorry. The other person that may um, know more about that too is um, Alyssa and she is um, a district forester and our out, um, acting outreach forester in Augusta right now and uh, Alyssa Gregory and um, if you're looking to get information about a wrap plan she is also the one that manages that program from the top so uh, she'd be a good contact. And feel free to call our office. Um, we're going to have to um, finish up now. Um, MainWoodlandOwners.org is a great uh, place to find a lot of this information as well on our resource page and our new Woodland Owner um, page as well. We have some great stuff for for new member for new managers and owners. And then you can always call our office at 207-626-0005. That's what we're here for is to have people call and just and get information out and help people with what they need, what they want to work on with their woods. And the Forest Service is the same and your district forester is there to help. So we are all connected. This has been great, Dan. Thanks again. I, um, I think a great way for you to finish up your main Forest Service job and um we we really appreciate this this video is going to be on our website and um, we're hoping it's going to be on the uh, uh woods in your backyard website as well so we'll let everybody know when everything is up um and uh get you directed to all the different resources that dan has talked about today i hope everyone has a good rest of their day and i appreciate you joining us and please join us again for our other our future online programs and in-person programs Check our website and we'll see you in either in the woods or online. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.